Today's monster will have many adventurers dazed and confused, but for those who can actually catch one, a great reward awaits. Hello and welcome to Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up old creatures from past editions of Dungeons and Dragons and bring them to light for use in your current 5th edition campaign. My name is Joe Saya, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we are going to be taking a look at a creature that made its debut in Dark Sun. The Rasklin is a four-legged wolf-like silver furred yellow-eyed creature that traditionally roams the sands and dunes of the Dark Sun setting. They make their homes in the vast desert wasteland, however, they are known to pop up in other mysterious places from time to time. And while I have converted creatures from 1st and 2nd edition D&D before, uh, the version of this that I'm actually converting comes to us from Dungeon Magazine, issue 111. It's in this issue of Dungeon Magazine that we learned about the Rascalins' mischievous tendencies and their penchants for dragging adventurers across the desert wasteland in hot pursuit, literally. See, the Rascalin is a herbivore. They don't hunt other creatures for sustenance. They survive by eating what small amounts of vegetation they can find. But they are also magical creatures and have a very mischievous, if not somewhat benign intelligence. Not only that, their emotions are linked to one another in unforeseeable ways. So today we're going to talk about just exactly what these creatures are, how they fight, how they defend themselves, and of course some ways that you can use them in your 5th edition D&D game. So to get things started off here, we're going to talk about... So the Rasklin has two main forms of defense, the first of which is a straight up bite. As you would imagine, a wolf-like creature has pretty powerful jaws, so its only real means of physical attack are biting down on its enemies. Its second means of defense is actually in the form of casting spells. Now these creatures traditionally have psionic abilities, so they're not really casting magic in the way that you would think of it like a wizard or a sorcerer, but they have some powerful psionic abilities that essentially manifest as equivalent to magic spells. And they can do two things, they can cast Confusion and they can cast Longstrider. Now Longstrider is a pretty basic spell that just increases your walking speed, which is important for reasons we'll get into in a second here. But Confusion is great for throwing off predators along with any hunters, specifically adventurers maybe, who might be trying to take down one of these creatures for their pelts, which are very valuable and extremely sought after by people who know what to do with them. We'll also talk more about that in a minute. Now the reason that being able to cast Longstrider is so important is because these creatures are already pretty fast. They have a movement speed of 50 feet, which is normal for the type of creature that they are, but they are exceptional distance runners. See, a Rasklin never gets exhausted, so it can run in perpetuity. But when it uses all of its movement and then uses its action to dash, it gets to add an extra 20 feet on top of what it would normally be able to move, which brings its grand total of movement up to 120 feet. Long Strider is a pretty simple spell. It just adds 10 feet to your max move speed for a short amount of time, so, essentially, it would allow this creature to move 140 feet on its turn, assuming it uses the dash action. That's crazy fast! There are very few other creatures in D&D that can gain that level of speed. Now, the reason this is important to the Rasklin is because it doesn't really want to fight unless it has no other choice. In fact, as the books and magazine tell us, the only time a Rasklin will ever choose to fight is if its pups are threatened. So if a creature has invaded its den, which are very difficult to find, but more on that later, it's going to, of course, fight to defend its family. But in the open field, which is typically where these creatures live, what the Rasklin excels at is leading hunters on wild chases and will essentially just be able to outrun, and if it can't outrun something, outlast whatever might be trying to take it down. And it's for this reason they are considered extremely prestigious targets for fabled hunters. Because if anyone's able to take down one of these creatures, it's surely the mark of someone who is a master huntsman. Now the other major trait that the Raskin have going for them is this kind of empathic and somewhat telepathic psionic bond that they all share with the rest of their pack. It makes communicating with one another extremely easy because where 
a pack of wolves might howl over long distances to communicate ideas or locations with one another, the Raskin literally have a minor mental connection. Don't think of it so much as they're constantly linked into each other's brains, but think of it more as they can tell if the rest of their pack is feeling unsafe or if they're in a good mood or if things are not going so well for them. Whatever that emotional state might be projecting, the other members of its pack will be able to pick up on that. But what's really interesting is what happens when those ties are severed. If a Rasklin is killed, all other members of its pack within one mile instantly become aware of it and snap into a sort of berserker rage. And this rage functions very similarly to that of the Barbarian, actually. They take half damage from many different types of attacks, and they also gain a lot of extra damage on their bite attacks. So that single bite that wasn't too bad before suddenly does the damage of nearly two bites, and they're also much harder to kill. This is why anyone who's trying to hunt one of these creatures has to be especially careful, because just killing one is very difficult, but that's not the end of the road for you. If you kill one of them, then you have to deal with the others who may be nearby. And their rage will not stop until either they have completely lost sight of their target, or they themselves have also been slain. So while their appearance should project to your players initially that these creatures aren't just simple animals, they might not be expecting that. So while the initial appearance of these creatures should definitely tell your players these guys aren't simple beasts, there's definitely a lot more going on than meets the eye at first glance. Now that's all good and fine, but before we actually get into combat with these things, we need to do a bit of setup, so let's take a look at some. So as I've mentioned briefly before, these creatures are kind of considered one of the penultimate beasts to try and hunt down for many hunters. And the reason I bring that up is because not only does it specifically talk about that in the lore of this creature, it's also a very interesting dynamic. So something I thought about when making this creature for 5th edition is why exactly hunters would value this creature so highly. I mean, sure, they're extremely tough to track down, so having a cloak or some other type of clothing made out of the hide of one of these creatures would definitely mark you as an accomplished hunter, and that in and of itself can be enough, really. But I've also included options in the stat block, like I've done in the past with some other beasties that we've had, to include the creation of a magic item. So you don't have to use this rule, but if you want to give your players even a little bit more incentive as to why they might want to hunt one of these creatures down, they might do so with the hopes of gathering its pelt and then making a silver star cloak. See, if they're able to take the pelt to a leather worker, or maybe they have someone in the party who is proficient with those types of tools, they can craft this into a cloak that increases their move speed by 10 feet and also allows them to cast Confusion once per day, presumably by sweeping the cloak and kind of causing the light in the room to reflect off of the actual cloak itself, because it's not just silver in color, it is literally somewhat metallic. If you've seen my video on the Orum Vorax, think of these guys as kind of the silver counterpart to those creatures. And this might bring you back to when I talked about the Orum Vorax, because you can use this type of quest as a really interesting way to introduce a party into a foreign culture that they might not be used to. There could be a tribe or village or town or city or whatever scale you want to bring this up to, but a group that highly praises their hunters and maybe hunting one of these creatures is a test for these newcomers to their lands to see if they're actually capable and they're not all just talk. I mean, this could be a really fascinating thing where the players go out just thinking, oh, we're going to go encounter something and fight it, but then they have to start coming up with clever ways of how they're going to be able to track down this creature because just straight up running up on one of these things is going to be nearly impossible in a big open environment. So you have to outsmart one of the cleverest and trickiest creatures that's going to be lurking around in the sands. And that's part of the reason why I love these guys so much is because they create that dynamic of the puzzle encounter. They're not just a bag of hit points that you hit and then they hit you back and then you hit and hopefully you can hit them harder than they hit you. Even initiating an encounter with these guys is a challenge in and of itself. And for a creature like this, one who is hunted but also respected in its own right for being as deft as it is for a beast, it can kind of inform some of the lore and some of the kind of mystical beliefs that these that these people might have about their environment because so many of our urban legends or myths or stories whatever you want to call them that exist revolve around things that occur naturally around us and in a fantastical world like one that might exist in dungeons and dragons 
creatures like this can become more of a symbol than anything else. For example, if I was going to use a town, say, that traditionally hunted these creatures, the sigil of that area or of those people might be a drawing of the head of a Rasklin. And only their most noble and highly esteemed warriors would wear cloaks of Rasklin hide because getting to that level or kind of stepping into that role of a truly powerful warrior would require you to pass some kind of test where maybe you have to go hunt one of these things. It would be a great little quirk for a people who have kind of like a ranger-esque approach to battle and kind of exercise guerrilla warfare. These creatures could even be really interesting animal companions for an NPC who displays similar qualities. I think a Raskin would make a perfect companion to a Horizon Walker Ranger that the players encounter now and again who might be there to either help or hinder their progress. And of course, if you just like the creature and you don't like any of the lore attachments to it, you can, as I've always said, just take that away and use it as a stat block for what it is and come up with your own kind of interesting story as to why it might behave the way it does. But at the end of the day, like I always say, an encounter that makes your players think is usually a good encounter. So for that reason, that reason alone, these creatures get the okay from me and that's primarily why I decided to convert them into 5th edition. So if you do decide you want to use these creatures, check out the description below. There is a link to a Google document with all the stat block information you will need to run a successful encounter with the Rasklin. And of course, if you're one of my awesome patrons, you can get the same information, but kind of in the monster manual style stat block all done up fancy like for you on the Patreon page. As always, thank you so much for watching. I do appreciate it. And if you have any suggestions for monsters you'd like to see me cover in the future, you can tell me about that either here on YouTube or in the chat on Discord. In any case, I will see you in the next video. Until then.